Hi guys, welcome back to Switch Up. I'm Mark Walker, and today we're going to look at Persona 5 Strikers on Nintendo Switch, which launches on February the 23rd in the West, almost a year to the day that it released over in Japan, and was developed by Omega Force and Peace Studios. And you'll recognize the name of Omega Force from the Dynasty Warriors franchise. This game acts as a direct sequel to Persona 5, but with the directors, Mumona Suda and Dasuki Kaneda, taking some real risks by shifting focus to the action RPG style. But certainly less risky than the previously released Persona 5 Dancing in Starlight. Thanks to the publisher Atlas for the review copy, is going down the Dynasty Warriors route the ace in the hole for the series, or perhaps it's the Joker? Well, let's find out. It's the country. I can sense the energies of powerful shadows. In terms of narrative then, series veterans are going to find no real issues here, but if you're new to the series, some of what I'm about to say is going to fall well into the category of WTF, but we'll try and keep it as succinct as possible. Just four months since the events of Persona 5, you'll join the merry band of Phantom Thieves as they plan out a road trip. However, the wheels of this plan come off quite quickly when local celebrity Alice has found a way to steal the desires of the local populace and lock them up in a parallel dimension version of Tokyo called uh, the jail. <laughs> I did warn you, but the prospect of a desire-stealing witch proves too tantalizing a task to ignore for the Phantom Thieves and their investigation begins. With a couple of new cast inclusions, the AI Sophia, and my personal favorite, Gramps, aka Zenkichi the police officer. For example, you noticed the one over there yet? Dumbass, what are you doing? If you are new to the series, then Zenkichi essentially acts as your proxy within the game, as his reactions to everything that I've just mentioned are exactly how mine would be. And it is nice to have a slightly older character to contrast the mainly high school age cast. Or at least it's just making an old man like me feel better. As far as gameplay and controls go, contrary to what you might think, this isn't just a Persona game with Dynasty Warriors gameplay throughout. In fact, it's an amalgamation. I'd say you're looking at 50% visual novel, 30% combat, 5% investigation, shopping and exploring, and 15% towers. And uh, I'll get onto that in a second. Story exposition takes up a great amount of time on screen, which isn't a negative. There are a number of dialogue choices which you can make, but these won't have a lasting impact on the gameplay experience. When you enter the jail, you'll have a number of objectives which are indicated to the player with a red exclamation mark, and following these will generally lead you in the right direction. But before you can visit the jail in each city, of which there are several, you'll have to undertake an investigation. This essentially amounts to wandering around a small area, listening in to conversations, talking to everyone until you fill your investigation percentage bar, and that's job done. And it's here where Striker's first weakness begins to show itself, with its side activities and areas not being given quite the same attention as something like the combat, making them feel quite arbitrary, and merely there as a means to prolong the next progressive story element. When you do eventually enter those jails, this is where Persona shines. You can run, jump, launch yourself towards chosen areas or surfaces, and even sneak attack enemies, unleashing an ambush on them, allowing you to do great deals of damage before the combat's even begun, and put them all off guard. When you enter combat situations, your movements are all controlled in real time, but by holding down an R bumper button, you can freeze the gameplay experience and plan out which of your persona moves to use next. Using the left and right on the D-pad, you can quickly switch between your party members, and essentially, you'll be looking for the elemental attacks that show the weak symbol, and as with previous games, targeting weaknesses will allow you to do an all-out attack with the whole party. While combat enjoyable, it does have its balancing issues. If you're just performing standard attacks, you'll find yourself getting hit from behind by essentially invisible enemies, which will interrupt your flow, and as the game goes on and the difficulty ramps up, there's an overemphasis on those SP abilities. At certain points, other party members might offer a suggested move, which is shown up in the left of the screen, and if you can be quick enough and press that button, it will trigger a more powerful attack. I did enjoy how easy it was to quickly switch between your party members fire off a few skills, switch back, and then concentrate on building up that show-stopping attack. And these show-stoppers really do live up to their name. Did you 
and provide another tactical benefit and reason to switch between party members on tougher fights. You might raise this attack almost to full for each character and unleash them all in quick succession. They'll stagger an enemy, generally wipe any lower level enemies from the screen, and man do they look cool. You'll find a number of boss encounters in Persona, and although there are three difficulty levels, you don't really want to be on the easiest of these as it takes away any need for tactical decision making. Despite its flaws, I really enjoyed the combat and it would be remiss not to mention how quick it transitions from running around the world to combat and back, with the developers clearly putting an emphasis on trying to maintain the fluidity of gameplay. The worlds themselves have quite a bit of verticality to them, including a number of hidden treasure items and some nods to classic 2D platformers, although the platforming from this perspective felt quite disconnected, with ledge grabs and other environmental interactions lacking the connectedness of a dedicated platformer. In each of the cities, there'll be a different jail, and I began to worry in the first 20 hours of the game as the first few are very similar. The area will have some towers that you need to go to. This will then unlock the final area. You'll fight a boss and then move on to the next city. They do shift things and switch it up a little at the halfway point which in all honesty came a little bit too late but I was glad to see it. The jails or dungeons if you want to call them that might see you battling to keep your hacker alive or traversing jet set future style across wires to flip switches and there are a couple of puzzles thrown in that use your third eye ability. This is performed by holding down the trigger and becomes an essential tool for assessing the different shadows, the enemies within the world, their overall threat level but also finding secret areas which won't be visible to the naked eye. The checkpoint system within the game allows you to travel back to the real world and it's from here that you can also save or visit the velvet room through which you can combine two of your persona to create a more powerful one and then choose one of their traits. It's seen some simplification since other games but it still works well and allows you to save these combinations. When you reach the second city, you unlock the cooking ability, which allows you to purchase ingredients from shops and then cook up a number of dishes for use in combat. While you can purchase SP and HP restoring items from shops and vending machines, they tended to be prohibitively expensive or inconsistently stocked, to the point where cooking your own was much more beneficial and meant that during combat, you could keep all parties' SP levels high. And unfortunately, it was here where I found the balancing issues I mentioned. As I could just pause time whenever I wanted, fire off an SP ability that staggers all enemies on screen, and then spam the all out abilities. If you're someone that tends to go in just throwing your fists around, you wouldn't even notice it. And although it didn't completely spoil combat, it made them feel overpowered and almost like I was cheesing the game. It's worth mentioning that fans of Persona are going to absolutely love the story. The writing and interactions between all of them are laugh out loud funny, and the story alone is more than enough to engage most players. And the rest of the gameplay mechanics combined are okay, but never reach the lofty heights of the other games in the series. Combined then, I give story and gameplay 15 out of 20 and the controls 16 out of 20. Visually, Persona 5 Strikers has both outstanding and lacklustre elements. And I'll start off with something that really impressed me, and is not something I would normally notice, and that's the UI elements. Every aspect of the UI, the menu design, and its visual implementation are slick. There are small animations tied to every action within a menu, that give it a real sense of style. The story is punctuated with a number of fully animated segments, which blend perfectly into the action, with some outstanding set pieces. And that same style carries over through every aspect of the game. And it's that visual consistency and delivery that made it easier to push past some of the game's more lethargic areas. Performance is very good in both docked and handheld, with it able to maintain 30 FPS almost all the time. Visual quality isn't quite as good on Switch, with some very obvious pop-in when you're moving forwards and backwards within an area, and a few questionable textures. It's saved on its art direction and colour palette, and looks great in motion. There are a couple of clunky character animations, as we come to expect with many of these JRPGs, but still the overall art direction and style is top draw. As far as the audio goes, Persona 5 Strikers has an excellent soundtrack. And 
I didn't experience musical fatigue, which comes from a short repetitive loop. Sound effects are also decent, but the star of the show is the stellar voice work. The road trip storyline and this cast of characters in a camper van gave me Stand By Me vibes. And it was many of the throwaway lines of dialogue that stuck with me the longest, as is so often the case. I give visuals and performance 15 out of 20, and the audio 19 out of 20. Persona 5 Strikers is a long game. It's going to take you at least 40 to 50 hours to finish, and then if you can meet certain conditions, you'll unlock the new game plus mode. So what's that? About a pound an hour. But some of those more reductive gameplay elements mustn't be overlooked. Overall, I give value 15 out of 20. Ready for an ass kicking? By its conclusion, Persona 5 Strikers had validated its place as a worthy sequel from a narrative perspective, but not everyone will gel with the current gameplay mechanics. There's certainly fun to be had, but if you're a newcomer to the series, I would strongly suggest trying to play the fourth or fifth games in the series on a different platform. Persona 5 Strikers on Nintendo Switch scores a Switch Up score of 79%. Let me know down in the comments, is this one you were looking forward to? Will you be picking it up at launch? And if you enjoyed the content, then consider sticking around. For all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers guys, see ya! I'm running out of time, every day goes by so fast And every moment counts, baby, I don't wanna miss a thing under the stars, we can sleep under the stars Or hang out in hotel bars, driving somewhere in your car We can sleep under the stars, we can sleep under the stars Under the stars, baby